Your Excellency, thank you for uh, being on the road to net zero with Khalid's Times. This podcast more or less will speak about climate issues and, uh, you know, it kind of paves the way for COP28. Thank you for having us, Your Excellency. Assalamu alaikum and thank you very much, Mr. Dayami. It's always a pleasure to uh, meet you. Likewise. And uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity as South Africa to be uh, podcasted on a very important uh, show run by uh, Khalid Times. Thank you, Your Excellency. The, the pleasure is all ours, of course. You know, climate change is affecting everyone globally. It's about inclusivity. And, you know, the Global South is among the regions that have been affected the most uh, by climate. Uh, what were the challenges that South Africa faced uh, because of the climate change? Now, you make an important point, the Global South, you know, just broadly. In an issue like climate change, it's poor people who get affected the most. And it's poor people who have contributed the least to issues of climate change because they're not into uh, uh, the kind of living that we have seen taking place in the last uh, century or even the last 20 years. Poor people, majority who are in the global south, live simple lives. South Africa obviously is a developing nation. We have uh, advanced uh, industry, we have mining, uh, we have reserves of, of fossil fuel, uh, we have large reserves of coal, and essentially our economy has turned on those resources that we now have to relook at. So we, we talk, when we talk climate change, we're talking about renewable energy. We're talking about giving up uh, sources of energy that have powered our country mm -hmm. and uh, you know we have been pioneers in bringing fuel liquid fuel from coal and we've used our coal to power our energy but South Africa clearly understands that we have to uh, contribute and play our part in issues that arise out of climate change. Climate change is a reality. I've seen it. I'm uh, into retirement now, 66 years old. I've, I've, I've listened, I've seen uh, how it's affected uh, our country, uh, you know, in terms of weather patterns, in terms of flooding, in terms of, you know, being very cold, getting snow in South Africa. But for us, the challenges that are presented by uh, what we call uh, the energy, the just energy transition, and we, 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 we say to deal with climate issues, we have to look at the way uh, we energize our country. So South Africa is clearly on course uh, and is preparing itself to move away from energy sources that have created uh, difficulty for us uh, in the world as far as climate matters are concerned. Do you think, Your Excellency, that renewable energy sources or alternative renewable en energy sources are actually sustainable comparing to, in comparison to the conventional uh, uh, sources of energy? You know, we have that debate in our own country. Lots of people are saying if we get short of uh, you know, our stock mm -hmm. uh, that has powered us all these years, and in this instance, coal, where we have vast reserves, uh, where we even export uh, to countries, it drives our economy, it gives our poor people a source of energy, you know, we burn coal. Uh, and then to say we must move away from it, is not going to be easy, it's going to be difficult. So a lot of, there is a stream of thought, and quite correctly so, in the world, but particularly in South Africa, that if we just get short of uh, our traditional uh, uh, fuel resources, uh, it's going to create big, great difficulty, particularly for jobs, particularly for developments of particular areas in our country where 
the, the, the coal resource is, 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 is huge. Uh, and one would be caught uh, in that transition. How do you bring along people uh, by telling them you can't use this anymore, but we are giving you something new? Now, that in itself is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Has it, do we have to do that? I think, yes, we have to, if we're going to take climate change seriously. It's expensive, extremely expensive. You know, South Africa held COP, COP 17 was held in South Africa. We're now in COP 28, 11, 12 years later. Uh, where have we gone? Is this all just talk? Can it happen? Uh, and, and are people serious about uh, issues of climate change? But I think as a country, South Africa, in as much as the UAE, and I believe, you know, that's a separate topic I can, I can chat about, we're very interested, very keen, and we think it's imperative. But we need to manage what has driven us before and where we want to go to and what is it that we want to, what is it that has to replace what we have. So I'm not sure yet. The discussion, the debate around uh, 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 just giving up our traditional uh, uh, sources of energy and transitioning into the new uh, is not going to be easy for you, many reasons. Do you think your excellency with the pledges of a hundred billion dollars as a start, you know, if it is to be reached or secured, do you think it's a way to kind of, you know, ensure that there is climate financing for all of these renewable projects? Do you think that there will be some sort of collective acknowledgement that, you know, things are happening, we are walking that path, there is commitment from all of the nations. Do you think that will change this perception? You know, we've come down with this issue of financing. It's, I think, a critical issue in, it's going to be an important component or discussion in COP28, you know. Uh, we are very, very keen and very interested and I think we have uh, input to make into climate financing as South Africa. Now, you know, I, I don't want to be skeptical about it, but if we believe that financing is important for developing nations, underdeveloped nations, you know, the island, the least developed countries, and countries like us from the global south, then it's money, it's mm -hmm. that finance that will carry us through. Now, uh, that has yet to be seen, I hope, because that will go a long way in getting nations to accept. It but, will go a long way in getting our people to accept that, listen, we can give up uh, fuel resources that damage the, 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 the environment and damage climate. Uh, and, and we have the money uh, that will ensure that where we transition to is just and that it's going to be uh, a proper and a suitable replacement for our traditional sources of fuel. Mm -hmm. Money is critical. It's important. And I think that uh, the UAE uh, and under the leadership of Dr. Sultan has uh, made this an important part of the discussions that will take place at COP28. And the UAE, I think, is very, very serious and understands that mm -hmm. this is important. Your Excellency, along these lines, there is this debate that the UAE is not only serious, but because it's also considered a wealthy country, it was able, you know, to kind of diversify its energy resources uh, through uh, Masdar city uh, or Masdar, uh, for instance, and through also other projects, and it has been leading other renewable energy projects around the world. Do you think that perhaps, you know, this involvement of the private sector of UAE and renewable energy and ensuring that, you know, this transition or this know-how that UAE has is to be transferred, whether it's about financing, whether it is about you know, the whole diversification process uh, would actually help to a certain degree, you know, the implementation of Dr. Sultan's vision. 
Indeed, I think, you know, it's, to put it uh, in simple terms, the UAE puts its money where its mouth is. It's done that. I've been here for just about six years. Mm -hmm. And in everything where the UAE has uh, expressed an intention, it has, you know, uh, gone and done it whether it's assistance, grants, Corona. I came, you know, just before Corona and I saw the kind of assistance we received as a country. And I've been here and I've gone to Mazdar City. I've been to Taka and its uh, solar energy plant mm -hmm. out here towards Al Ain. Uh, the UAE is serious about uh, the just energy transition. They have done and are continuing to do and explore ways. And also, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving a hand and uh, extending its hand to assist developing countries uh, in their efforts to go into, into renewable energy. Uh, and one sees many companies from the UAE expressing interest in South Africa's uh, drive to renewable energy and those that are already in South Africa and making a contribution, so, you know, through solar and looking at issues of, of wind uh, and hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So the UAE, I believe, has, uh, like I said, put its money where its mouth is, and one just needs to go around to see uh, how it has on its own uh, used or is using solar energy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited when our people come uh, from South Africa on official visits, uh, a visit to Masdar and a visit to, uh, you know, uh, institutions where discussions can be held on, on ways in which the UAE has gone about mm -hmm. uh, transitioning. Uh, so it's an example the UAE has set. And like I said, the UAE will extend its hand and will get involved in developing countries. That I think everybody who is here, and I think most of my colleagues who are here know that. Off these lines, Your Excellency, what do you think uh, is the part of the developed nations? How much of a part do they play? Very important part. You know, the developing nations, I mean, I'm going to say it with a lot of circumspection, and I may, and I don't think I'm wrong. I think they accept as well. Uh, that their drive in, from you know, the previous centuries towards industrialization uh, and their use of, you know, to just start off with coal, mm -hmm. their reliance on coal, uh, have, have contributed to matters uh, that affect the climate. I mean, there's no doubt in, in that. And I think... They've been doing it for many years. And we are newcomers, developing nations. I mean, we've hardly uh, uh, used our natural resources to its fullest capacity, mm -hmm. whereas the developing nations have probably depleted those kind of resources. And looking at, in this instance, say Africa, and you can see, you know, we have ample resources. So I think the developing nations have a responsibility uh, both, you know, active, actively, physically, financially, and in terms of, 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 of knowledge to assist the developing nations, to assist, uh, you know, the least developed nations, uh, so that, you know, firstly, we don't make the mistakes they made. Secondly, we, we, we look at alternatives, which they so, you know, everybody is trying to look at. And I think, so... One is, yes, they have, I think, been responsible for where we are. But number two, I think we can also learn mm -hmm. from the goodwill there is amongst developing nations to uh, get us into uh, a source of energy that would not do or devastate our climate further. This leads me to the thought that, you know, a lot of developed nations actually, you know, are part of the G7. Uh, they have the resources, they have uh, uh, the monetary aspect, they have the know-how, the research, the experience, the history, uh, and they can play further, uh, they can play a, let's say, very crucial role 
you know, in uh, leading the change that has been preached. And within these lines, whatever is happening right now on the ground, do you think it's enough? You know, for me, what is also very exciting is a country like, like the, the UAE mm -hmm. uh, that has, I, I would say, showing the way to developing nations, uh, putting the, its money where its mouth is. Uh, and saying, listen, this is how it needs to be done. This is where we need to go. And I think developing nations uh, are saying that the UAE is doing it. Uh, but clearly, we need to, we will learn, we have to learn from the intelligence and the knowledge that the developing nations have. They know, I think, I would be safe to say best, because, you know, they've been through it. Uh, they've been through what I would call climate devastation, mm -hmm. through, you know, practices. Uh, so I think there is a responsibility for them to the world, for our good, for their good, and for everybody's good, to share in mm -hmm. making sure that our planet is saved. But they, here again, you know, the UAE uh, has come forward and shown the developing nations what can be done and it's prepared to help yes, financially and it gets its companies and its investment uh, institutions to look at the developing nations to assist them uh, and, and you know it's not uh, only everybody beating a path to the UAE and asking it's the UAE itself reaching out to the developing world uh, and, and it's there, it's apparent, and one can see it happens all the time. But all of these uh, very big countries, let's say the G7 countries, play a fair share in terms of carbon emissions. Is what they're doing enough to mitigate that or to reduce it? Yeah, you know, that's uh, one of the things that one will have to look at and, and, and set and benchmark these things, you know, what are... What do we have to do or what do we have to pay or, uh, you know, in terms of carbon credits? Uh, what is our carbon footprint? Uh, you know, how, 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 how do we mitigate that and how do we atone for it and how do we pay for it? I think this is going to be in interesting discussions at COP28 as well. And, and I think it's, it's, it's what's exciting about COP28, it's that it's going to leave nobody behind. I mean, although it may sound like a mantra, but I think that's going to be correct. If we look at the program that, uh, you know, COP28 under the stewardship of Dr. Sultan has set out, it's going to leave no stone unturned. It's not going to leave anyone behind and it's going to leave nothing else behind, I think. So it's going to be uh, a COP28 that is going to unravel, take out all the issues that, uh, that affect climate change. You know, there were certain things previously where you kick for touch and you postpone, uh, you don't bring it out because it creates uh, difficulty for your own well-being or for your own development. And I think this COP is going to be different in the sense, in the, in the respect that it's going to leave it's going to pull no punches. Everything will be laid bare. Do you think even with the current, you know, regional conflicts that are happening, still this specific objective can be met? Oh, yeah. Look, I think, you know, uh, the world uh, sees conflicts all the time. But I think the, the, the greater good, uh, you know, particularly this, uh, at the end... It's collective uh, for everyone. It's for everybody, and I think these kind of things where you meet as nations, where you get together as nations, uh, instills a sense of the importance of peaceful coexistence. So I think COP28 will play that part as well, where we will meet as nations with a common goal, a common purpose. Uh, at the end of the day, the air you breathe is the air I breathe. What I want for myself is what you want for yourself Absolutely. as well. So I think that kind of goodwill COP28, in spite of what's happening, uh, is going to bring that out as well. You know, it's like we've seen, uh, you know, we've come through a Rugby World Cup. It's uniting us, you know, as a nation. We're diverse, we have different cultures, but, you know, this kind of event, this kind of success, and a successful COP is going to make the world realize that we need one another. Today, the pledge, Your Excellency, is at almost 100 billion. 
and the number that is needed is at least 1.35 trillion yes. in the next decade. Do you think that can be met? I'm not sure. But I think what is important that we have recognized that is what is needed. And we just need to ensure that we put into place plans uh, that will make that a reality. I will not say that there is a reluctance, but I will also be guarded and say that pledges sometimes remain exactly that mm -hmm. uh, and are not put on the table. But importantly, I think we've recognized what it needs. And if you're going to be serious about uh, the necessity for funding, uh, then we must work actively, and those who have it, uh, you know, need to be serious about it. Uh, you know, you can't draw us or draw uh, countries that are most affected or will be most affected by climate into a, 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 a an issue that requires funding, uh, and then you you know you don't uh, put that on the table. I think that is, you know, leading us uh, the wrong up the wrong path. And please correct me, Your Excellency, uh, the President of South Africa will join for the COP28 discussions this year. Oh, yes, indeed. The President will be here. He, he uh, attends COP. He, we have already submitted uh, our confirmation received from our President's office himself. So the President will definitely... And this is a reflection of the commitment of South Africa. Yes, I think you will see South Africa uh, has important and I think good, you know, uh, individuals with, uh, with the knowledge uh, that would, I think, enrich discussions on COP28. We take it seriously. Our president takes it seriously. Our ministers responsible take it very seriously. And other ministers that have, uh, through their portfolios, uh, relations to issues of climate change, you know, there are issues around uh, uh, agriculture, show an interest in, 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 in uh, these kind of discussions. Obviously, these are peripheral discussions, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, clearly uh, of interest to South Africa. So definitely our president will be here and he will also be very, uh, I think, uh, clear on the, on, on the line that South Africa, Africa, and you know, the global south and the developing nations uh, were, you know, need to take on, 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 on these kind of matters. Any final words, any comments, anything, Your Excellency, perhaps that you want to share with us, you want to share with the audience about, you know, what is your aspirations after COP28? You know, firstly, let me, let, let, if, you are, if you would allow me. Please. I, was the Commissioner General for Expo 2020. And I think that the UAE put up one amazing expo. I don't know if uh, that kind of show can be repeated. It will in time, but the benchmark and the standard has been set mm -hmm. by the UAE. For us as South Africa, our participation, we are beginning to see the fruits of our participation at Expo. And that goes through, I think, in monetary terms, in the trade relations between our countries, mm -hmm. in the interest shown by other countries who are at Expo. Uh, so the UAE is now holding COP28, I believe, with the same kind of energy that it held Expo. And my expectation is that this COP is going to set and take the climate change discussion forward in leaps and bounds, uh, just in the way the UAE has approached COP28 and the way it has opened up matters that are critical for discussion and for implementation uh, in matters 
that affect the climate. <coughs> I'm excited. I will. I leave pretty soon from the UAE, but I think I uh, will see wherever I am the fruits of what the UAE uh, has uh, will reap and what it has done for different parts of the world. I'm excited and I think I will not be disappointed wherever I am in my retirement. <laughs> Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you for your time. We, you will be missed, of course. <laughs> But thank you for a wonderful interview, Your Excellency, and uh, inshallah, whatever we aspire for from COP28 will be achieved. Inshallah, and I would like you to come to South Africa, of course, Mr. Al Riyami, to see what I've been boasting about, <laughs> and also, I think, uh, the spin-offs of COP28 and the involvement of the UAE in the development of South Africa in every sphere. Inshallah. Thank inshallah. you, Your inshallah. Excellency. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.